Hello and welcome everybody to a safe return to in-person schooling, an urgent call to action in the, to close adolescent vaccination care gaps. Um, my name is John Zimmerman. I'm from Whole On Solutions. And our focus in our business is to leverage information technology to help providers and patients close any and all care gaps. I'm really delighted to open up today's uh, situ uh, uh, scenario or presentation today by introducing uh, Dr. Mary Burton from the NCQA, the Vice President of Performance Management Measurement. Dr. Mary Burton oversees the development, use, and maintenance of techniques NCQA uses to evaluate healthcare quality. She ensures the scientific integrity of NCQA measurement and research. Prior to NCQA, Ms. Uh, Dr. Barton worked for the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, AHRQ, where she was the scientific director of the US Preventative Services Task Force. Dr. Barton trained in primary care and internal medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and completed a general medicine research fellowship at Harvard. It's my pleasure to introduce you, Dr. Barton. Please take it away. Thank you so much, John, and thank you to Holon Pharmaceuticals for sponsoring our work here today. Um, as John said, we're here to talk about a safe return to in-person schooling. So if I could have the next slide, please. So why are we talking about this today? Well, in fact, NCQA's business is working with health plans and health plans can influence providers and parents about this current problem. Um, we know that school age vaccination rates have dropped really significantly during the pandemic. And catching up with those vaccinations is crucial to having students return safely to the school environment. The American Cancer Society is involved because the HPV cancer prevention vaccine is down over 1 million doses in the public sector alone compared to what happened in 2019. So during this webinar today, we are looking to demonstrate the impact of the pandemic on school age and adolescent immunization rates provide concrete actions that health plans can take to catch up on missed or overdue vaccinations between now and May, and to provide new tools and resources for you to use to engage your members. This is really a community effort. We need health plans, practitioners, and patients all to collaborate in order to close these gaps. I'm delighted to have here with me today from NCQA, Safine Byron, Assistant Vice President in my department, Lindsay Roth, a Senior Research Associate, and our colleagues across the a yard, the Sarah Comstack from the American Cancer Society, who's Director of Clinical Interventions there, and Jennifer Conga, who's Director of Health Systems and Provider Engagement at the National HPV Vaccination Roundtable. Finally, we're delighted to have joining us today, Dr. Melinda Wharton, Melinda Wharton currently serves as the Director of Immunization Services at the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. She trained at Harvard Medical School, Johns Hopkins University, University of Michigan, and Duke University. Uh, she joined the CDC in the Epidemiologic Intelligence Service in 1986 and joined CDC's immunization program in 1992, and since that time has promoted appropriate use of vaccinations. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Wharton. Over to you. Thanks so much for that introduction. I, and I'm really delighted to be able to talk to you all today because this is, this is a really urgent problem. And I think you all are so well positioned to help us uh, address it. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about routine childhood vaccination in the time of COVID and the urgent need for vaccination for a safe return to school. So as I know you all know, there was a major uh, reduction in the number of ambulatory care visits uh, starting a year ago, March, uh, with the beginning of the state home orders and the national emergency being declared. Next. 
uh, we we saw at the time that drop in ambulatory care visits occurred, a major drop in ordering in our federal uh, vaccines for children program. And this graph was from an MMWR, which we published in early May last year, which showed the, we the weekly drop in orders for uh, all pediatric vaccines other than influenza vaccines through the Vaccines for Children program, um, comparing the current year to the year before. Uh, and then uh, within that, uh, there's a, the dotted line shows measles containing vaccines on the, on the right hand y axis. Um, it was a very dramatic reduction in vaccine ordering associated with this drop in doctor visits. Next. Now, since then, um, the, there's been stabilization of, uh, of ambulatory care visits with um, many, many patients, many families returning to their primary care offices. And um, that's great. Next. But while this was going on, a lot of children missed well child visits. Um, this graphic actually shows data as reported by parents of children up to uh, through five years of age through a uh, survey which the University of Oregon did uh, repeatedly between March and October of last year. And, um, and you can see that, um, par that many parents of young children reported that they had missed well child visits and there was a pretty strong tendency to miss more visits as children got older. Now this graph doesn't include uh, the older children, the ones uh, beyond the school entry age, but you can imagine that it might be even higher given the strong age dependence of, uh, of missing these visits. Next. Uh, so uh, we've continued to monitor our public sector vaccines order, vaccine ordering through the Vaccines for Children program. And this graph shows our, um, is, is updated with our most recent data. In this graph, we are comparing the, the, um, the week in 2020 or now 2021 with the comparable week in 2019 for comparison and uh, with the most recent weeks on the, on the far right side. And as you, as you look in, I don't know, the last two thirds or so of the weeks it, on, a, on a week by week basis, it doesn't look too bad. Some of them are comparable, some are a little worse, some are a little better, uh, some are quite a bit worse. Um, but overall, it, it does look like there's been substantial rebound in VFC provider orders, which is good. So as children have gone back, um, the vaccine is being ordered and, and given to them. Next. But in spite of that rebound, there's still a really substantial deficit in our provider orders compared to the 2019 baseline period. As of February 28th of this year, overall our VFC provider orders other than flu are down by more than 11 million doses. Yeah. And of that 1.4 million doses are measles containing vaccines, either MMR or measles, mumps, rubella, varicella. And I probably don't need to remind you that we had a large measles outbreak in the United States in 2018, 2019. So uh, this is of particular concern as we're thinking about kids going back to school, not being up to date on measles. There are other data which show a slower recovery in the public sector compared with the private sector. Next. Um, the, the gap among our, our VFC provider orders, the gaps vary among vaccines. And if we look at the vaccines given to younger children, the overall deficit um, is less than the vaccines that are given to the elder kids. So for example, rotavirus vaccine, which is only given to children under six months of age, down by about 6%. PCV13, which is a four dose series with the fourth dose in the second year of life, down by 8.6%. DTAP containing vaccines with a five dose series with the last dose at four to six years, down by 10%. Compare that with the three vaccines that are recommended for routine use at 11 to 12 years, Tdap, uh, HPV, and meningococcal conjugate vaccine, all down 17 to 21%. So the, the, 
the biggest reductions among these vaccines are clearly for the vaccines given to the older kids. But measles containing vaccine, that vaccine that we are most worried about when it comes to outbreaks in schools um, is also down by 21 percent. Next. Um, and another just now we don't have timely vaccine coverage data for routine vaccines through our national immunization survey. We'll have that eventually, but there's a substantial lag because it's provided verified data and we look at it in annual chunks. So we'll have our data from the 2020 survey later this year. But in the meantime, we do look at parental reported data for flu vaccine on a weekly basis. So we have data for the for flu vaccine coverage based on parental report for the current flu season. Um, this slide shows data uh, through uh, early January, but um, this there's not been a lot of flu vaccination done since then, so I'm, I'm sure it still holds. Um, overall, our flu vaccine coverage is down just a little bit, 55% uh, compared to 57.2% the season before. But within that, we're seeing larger decreases among um, Black and Hispanic children, worsening the disparities that already existed in flu vaccine coverage. Yeah. So out of all the trouble this year with getting kids in, it appears that Black and Hispanic children uh, may be more impacted uh, than uh, white non-Hispanic children. Next. And we do have a little bit of, of a clue about why that might be, uh, going back to this report from the University of Oregon. Um, they, the, these data are from their report, um, just looking at middle and upper income households. And even within that more privileged group, there were disparities in uh, the proportion of parents who had in fact missed well child visits. Um, with greater proportions among Black and Hispanic parents. Um, the, the, and, and the reasons parents reported that they'd missed visits also uh, showed some differences across race ethnicity with um, Black parents um, more commonly reporting that they could not keep, they could not make the well child visit because of other family care responsibilities uh, child care or other family responsibilities. And uh, for the Hispanic parents, uh, they reported more concern about contracting COVID uh, in the course of seeing, seeing physicians. So um, e even among middle and upper income households, there were these disparities seen. Next. Uh, so there is, there is an urgent need for catch up as as we are all wanting children to be able to safely return to school. Um, clearly many school aged children did miss recommended vaccines over the last year due to the disruptions associated with COVID-19. Um, this is especially concerning for measles vaccine and those vaccines routinely recommended at ages 11 to 12. And, and with the transition to virtual learning uh, and all the other things schools have been dealing with. Um, at least some schools have, have clearly not been focusing on compliance with school vaccination requirements during the 2020-2021 the school year. Now, we don't know if or when a COVID vaccine will be available for children, but if it is, we can't count on being able to administer other vaccines simultaneously um, or within two weeks of COVID-19 vaccination, which depending on how many doses of vaccine are recommended could produce a, a period where other vaccines can't be given that could be a month or two. Um, and then, and because of all this, we really need to focus now on getting children caught up on doses they missed so that they can safely return to in-person learning. Next. Um, I, I, I saw this in the Washington Post the other day and, and I thought it made the point that um, the focus of the article was on a school system in, in the District of Columbia that had actually done a really good job of reaching out to families and, and um, reassuring them about the safety of returning to school. And many families um, agreed to consider it, um, were willing for the children to return to school because of the excellent outreach that the school had done. Um, but 
buried within the article were these two sentences. Many are unable to return because they lack the immunizations required to enter the buildings. Youth vaccinations have plummeted during the pandemic and nurses are working with these families to schedule appointments at a nearby clinic. Um, of course, school, school vaccination requirements are important, um, but if we don't get kids caught up when it's time for them to return to school, they may not be able to. Next. So I'm particularly excited to talk to you all because there's so many things that payers can do to help um, address this problem. Uh, payers can remind all families of the importance of recommended vaccines as children return to in-person school. They can identify families whose children have missed doses and remind them to schedule appointments with their healthcare provider. They can encourage healthcare providers to identify children who do or overdue for recommended vaccines and, in, and encourage them to contact those families to schedule appointments and let families know what precautions are in place for safe delivery of in-person services because we know that some families still have these concerns. And of course, um, things like sample messaging and templates for healthcare providers for communication with families also can help. Um, you know, we're, we're doing as part of our national immunization survey, um, a couple of questions about well child visits. And for the most week, recent week of data that we have, 14% uh, of parents six months, to four, six months to 17 years of age reported that their child had missed a well child visit within the last two months. So this continues to be a problem. And um, I'm, I'm really delighted to have a chance to, again, to talk with you all today because I think there's so many things you all can do that can help address this and uh, lead to the outcome we all want, which is for our kids to be back in school safely. Uh, next. Uh, so that's, that's uh, everything I had. Um, I, if there's time, I'd be happy to take some questions. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Wharton. Um, I think I'm a little taken aback by a lot of the data that you showed. And I'm not sure if our audience is also still trying to digest what are the meanings of those, not only the decrease in visits, but the, uh, the, the racial and ethnic disparities that may have been worsened by those decreases in visits and how the decrease in vaccine ordering means that there's really fewer there's fewer shots in the physician's refrigerator and there's fewer shots going into kids' arms. I mean, it's really, um, uh, it's really kind of um, uh, disheartening in a way. Yeah. But, uh, you know, there is a question that has come in and I wonder if you have any ideas about how to talk to patients who might be hesitant to get a vaccine. Uh, sure. Um, so, you know, I think that there's, there's now a, a lot of experience in addressing vaccine hesitancy. And we know that for families who have concerns, you know, if they ask questions, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that they won't accept vaccination. They, maybe they've just got a question. And so we really encourage providers to, if parents ask questions, listen to their question and try to address the major thing they're concerned about, but also make a strong recommendation for vaccination. Um, parents really do rely on their healthcare provider. And so if providers are willing to listen to the question and concerns, briefly address it, and there's a lot of resources available uh, for how to answer parents' questions briefly, not getting into a big long conversation, but brief responses to the most common concerns. And then couple that with a, a strong recommendation for vaccination that goes a long way with many families to, to getting them to accept vaccination for their child. Thank you. 
thank you for that. Um, you know, the context is really important as we think about how the relationship between, for, for most pediatricians or pediatricians offices, they're taking care of young people who they've cared for since they were babies. And, and that really is an important relationship to yes. um, make sure that you uh, use that good feeling to continue this vaccination message. Um, I think, um, you know, when we're, when we're looking at how, um, you know, how to improve disparity, how to um, make sure that folks who are, have um, either lower income or, um, you know, racial groups that have been historically um, suffered prejudice in the medical care system, what are the ways that we can um, fix that? What are, yeah. I think are some of the most useful tools that we have. Yeah, thank you for asking that. And obviously, as we're thinking about COVID vaccination, this is so important, right? Uh, we, the, the disparities we see on the childhood side are much smaller than what we see for adults. Um, with adult immunization, the gaps are much larger. And this is actually an area that we've been very focused on for the last year. Um, we think that in addition to the kinds of um, supportive information from providers that they can provide their patients, the you know, listening to concerns, responding to the most important questions, and making a strong empathetic recommendation, in addition to those things which we'd recommend across the board. Um, we know that with um, in some of the communities with disparities, it's very important that there are trusted messengers who can really bring the vaccination message to those communities and help connect people with vaccination who may not have those connections. So, so access can be a part of it, but um, the, the, the major issue really is this lack of trust and hopefully families can trust their healthcare provider, but it will, it will help if there's other local known community uh, trusted messengers who can help support that message. So at least on the COVID vaccine side, that's really what we're, we're working on. And of course, we started this originally around adult immunization generally and flu vaccination. That's right. The, the lessons from one vaccine carry over to the next. And right. we're, uh, we're, we're glad to be able to stand on the shoulders of researchers who, who looked at this, you know, for flu vaccine years ago. Um, when I think we may only have one more question, time for one more question now, and I wonder if there's any, um, any recommendation you would have for one questioner who says there's been a large number of children who had their well child visit, but the vaccine was not available to them when they were in the office. Is that a scenario that you've heard much about? Uh, you know, I have not. I have not heard a lot about that, but I suppose that if offices had very unpredictable patient volumes, that it could be that providers did not have inventory on hand um, because of you know concerns about appropriate inventory management with uncertain patient volume. So I, I can imagine that that might have happened uh, early on. Uh, I, I actually have not heard a lot about that as a problem though, but you know that's another reason why it's important to get people back in. Um, to get those visits made up. Well, that's absolutely right. The most important thing is to, to bring together the vaccine and the arms <laughs> at the same it, time at the same place. It doesn't do any good in the refrigerator. No, no, that's absolutely right. Um, well, I think that we may be able to come back at the end with some time for questions and answers. And, and I really wanna thank Dr. Wharton again for joining us today and bringing this terrific data about uh, vaccine utilization and vaccine uptake and how we can track, you know, make up the difference between what happened last year and what's happened this year. Really important stuff. Um, so at this time, I'm going to turn, the, turn the, the, the microphone over to some folks on my team who have been working on how to um, really make a difference in health plans, performance of vaccines, 
And um, Safine Byron is going to pick up the ball. Thanks very much, Mary. Um, next slide. So uh, some of the Q&As coming in were asking us what can we do as a health plan. So hang tight because we're going to go through some of these. Um, so you're already anticipating what we're about to present. So why focus on adolescent vaccinations now? Um, so as, as Dr. Wharton mentioned, while we are all hopeful for an eventual COVID-19 vaccine for children, the rollout of a vaccine, if approved, may have implications for the timing of other child and adolescent vaccinations. For example, the current approved COVID-19 vaccines are recommended to be routinely administered alone because we do not yet have data on safety and efficacy of COVID-19 vaccines co-administered with other vaccines. The CDC recommends a minimum interval of 14 days before or after administration of any other vaccine, unless the benefits of vaccination outweigh the potential unknown risks of co-administration. But what this means is that when and if a COVID-19 vaccine is approved for children and adolescents, there potentially could be a period when other vaccinations may not be given, which could further delay a return to safe in-person schooling. So this is why we're urging plans to catch up adolescents on their meningococcal HPV and Tdap vaccinations now. Next slide. As Dr. Wharton shared, the data are alarming. Overall, vaccinations have dropped precipitously. So while vaccination rates have dropped for all children, rates for older children and adolescents are down almost 25% over the course of the pandemic. Health plans are uniquely positioned to assess gaps in vaccination rates, identify opportunities for improvement, outreach to their membership, and mobilize clinicians and others who are providing vaccinations to their members. Thus, we're calling on health plans to help close the vaccination gap. Next slide, please. We believe it starts with data. Uh, the Healthcare Effectiveness Data and Information Set, or HEDIS, is a tool for assessing a health plan's performance on important dimensions of healthcare. Over 190 million people are covered by HEDIS reporting health plans. HEDIS includes a measure that assesses whether adolescents received three routinely recommended vaccines per guidelines. You can see them here. They're meningococcal vaccine, Tdap vaccine, and HPV vaccine. It also looks to see um, a combination rate to see who received all three of those. And it applies to, to adolescents 11 and 12. Over 300 commercial plans and over 200 Medicaid plans reported this measure last year. So we feel it, it's a good place to start in terms of understanding who among a health plan's membership is getting vaccinated. Next slide. So health plans can start with data by analyzing their rates for the immunization for adolescents measure. In addition, several years ago, NCQA conducted a study to understand best practices in improving adolescent vaccination rates. We were focused on HPV vac vaccination at the time, but we believe that the lessons learned really apply to any sort of vaccine hesitancy or any sort of rates that need to be improved. Um, so health plans highlighted actually several things that they had done to improve their rates. Um, we believe that Plans can share back information with healthcare systems and providers in order to strengthen quality improvement efforts to make sure everyone is rowing in the same direction. Plans noted that they can provide written reports or sometimes they would grant providers access to interactive websites to view and compare performance. Um, they could reach out to providers who may not be performing as well and provide resources. Um, and plans can also do this for their membership. Uh, we also think plans can link to immunization information systems where possible in order to more broadly share data. I think the more that we know about where the gaps exist, the better we can do. Uh, we also think health plans can start by looking at the rates uh, for the past two years to see you know, what it looked like before the pandemic and what it looked like afterwards in order to be able to target your quality improvement efforts. So um, next slide. Whatever actions you take, it needs to make sense for your organization and capacity. Um, just start somewhere. <laughs> the focus of this initiative is at the population health level. And so while we're seeking to make a macro impact, the reality is that the decisions are made at the micro level by parents and healthcare providers who are, 
for helping those parents to, to get caught up. So this is where health plans can really make a difference. So I'm going to hand it to my colleague, Lindsay Roth, at this point, who's going to discuss core components of a payer action plan and give some more specific examples of how plans can reach out to both providers and also to their members and, and get the patient side as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sabine, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Sabine just said, we thought it would be helpful to provide some core initiatives that health plans can implement as part of an action plan to address the declines in adolescent immunization. And Dr. Wharton addressed several of these earlier in the presentation, and I'll expand on some of what she had already said. And then after that, I'll turn it over to our colleagues at the American Cancer Society and the HPV Vaccination Roundtable, who will share specific resources that you can take with you to use after this webinar. So as was noted earlier, if a COVID vaccine is approved for adolescents and children this summer, then the next several months are really crucial to get back on track with routine vaccinations. And many of the strategies on the next few slides are things that we learned about through past research and interviews with health plans that are high performers on the immunization performance measures. Some of these are also more recent initiatives that plans are undertaking specifically in response to COVID delaying preventive care services. And then I also wanted to note that our focus today is mostly on adolescent vaccination and some of the resources that we'll share later are also specific to HPV vaccination, but these strategies can also be used to address other vaccine types and populations starting now and continuing into the future. Next slide. So the first set of strategies that health plans can consider is prompting health systems and providers to act quickly on adolescent vaccination catch up and to assist them in their efforts. It's important to communicate to them the magnitude of the problem and the importance of having an early back to school immunization initiative. High performing health plans on HEDIS immunization measures have noted that provider buy in and advocacy is really crucial to their success. They shared that identifying physician champions and encouraging them to do peer-to-peer -peer outreach can really help to drive improvement. And then additionally, we know that our healthcare system has been overwhelmed over the past year, particularly those on the front lines of care. And one thing that health plans can do is to incentivize and recognize health systems and providers for addressing adolescent well visits and immunizations right now. We learned about a health plan that had provided an additional $100 bonus payment for every annual well visit that was completed last fall. And something similar to this could be adapted for adolescent well visits and immunizations performed between now and July, for example. And recognition and incentives like these may help to motivate providers that are experiencing burnout and help to encourage them to stay the course. Another set of strategies that health plans are implementing is to support health systems and providers in increasing vaccination opportunities and streamlining the vaccination process. Making the experience as user-friendly and easy as possible for patients can go a really long way toward increasing vaccination rates. And examples of how to minimize missed opportunities for vaccination include things like encouraging all types of providers, not just primary care providers, to assess patients for vaccinations that are due and providing them there. Um, another example is implementing standing orders so that non-physicians can order and administer vaccines. And then um, health plans have also shared that thinking more broadly beyond medical appointments is really helpful. And things like holding regular walk-in clinics for vaccinations where appointments are not required is also very useful to improving rates. Next slide. So health plans can also provide education and outreach to health systems and providers. Uh, many clinics and providers might not have much additional capacity at this time, so health plans can help by sending reminders to them on which of their patients are due for vaccines to help them target their outreach efforts. And um, vaccine hesitancy is also an issue, particularly with the HPV vaccination but there are effective techniques for how to address vaccine hesitancy, things like normalizing the HPV vaccine as a routine part of adolescent immunization is one strategy, also emphasizing its importance for cancer prevention. And health plans can help to educate providers and their networks on how to, incorpor how to incorporate these messaging techniques into conversations with parents and adolescents. And health plans can also share sample messages for providers to send to patients so that they don't have to spend time developing their own templates. And we'll share some of these with you later in the presentation. 
Um, another strategy um, that we've heard from health plans is that it's helpful to identify areas with high rates of vaccine refusal and target your resources there. So collaborating, collaborating with community organizations to educate providers in these areas on how to address vaccine refusal is a really useful technique that other plans have tried in the past. Next slide. And finally, health plans can disseminate information to their members. So they can reach out directly to their members, um, send consistent reminders to parents on scheduling adolescent well visits and vaccinations that are due. And more broadly, plans can implement campaigns through social media or other mediums to raise awareness of the issue and reiterate the importance for everyone to get back on track. We also know that social determinants of health can impact the ability of patients to access vaccines. So plans can implement things like screening for social risk factors and directing care managers to help at-risk patients with things like coordinating appointments or arranging transportation to appointments. So in summary, there are multiple ways that health plans can participate now in helping to get back on track with adolescent vaccinations. And many of the things that I just reviewed have been tried by other health plans. And we hope that by sharing these today, you can consider implementing some of them now as well as into the future. And now I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Comstock at the American Cancer Society. Hi, um, thanks, Lindsay. Um, so my name is Sarah Comstock. I'm a director of clinical interventions at the American Cancer Society. But today I wasn't going to talk about my day job. I was going to talk about my other role, which is mom to four kids. Um, you can see there on the screen ages one, eight, nine, and 11. So we are a busy household in a normal time. Um, but during a pandemic, it's especially um, overwhelming as many parents can experience. And as we were preparing the content for today's webinar, I reflected back on my own experience as a parent trying to navigate immunizations during the pandemic. And it happened that my youngest and my oldest both have spring birthdays. So in 2020, that meant Zoom birthday parties. It also meant I delayed their normal well-child visits where I figured out what our local family practice doctor was doing to maintain safety for our well-child visits. And Dr. Wharton's data backed that up that many other parents I think also delayed as they figured out how to navigate. It turned out that I, like the data showed, stayed on top of our one-year-old's appointment and only delayed about a month, but I got distracted after my older son turned 11 and his well-child visit was put on the back burner. Like so many other parents and caregivers, I was distracted by life, trying to work full-time, to working parents from home, virtual school, and four kids, and you can imagine the chaos that ensued. Looking back, actually in my email, I received several general it's safe to return to the clinic messages from my health center, but it wasn't until several months later when I got a tailored message from my health plan that specifically called out adolescent well child visits that it kind of prompted me into action. And I was able to reschedule my oldest son's appointment just a few weeks later and got him his Tdap meningococcal and HPV first dose. Um, he knew about what HPV stood for before he could learn to ride a bike. So you can see here, he was very excited to show me um, his vaccine injection site after he was fully vaccinated for all three vaccines. And I acknowledge I'm a public health oriented parent. I have resources, health insurance, and I work daily on improving HPV vaccination rates through my work at ACS. And still I got distracted. It was easy to prioritize other things, but thanks to those tailored messages that prompted me to reschedule, I have this happy, healthy 11 year old who's looking forward to a second dose of HPV vaccine. Um, I know that other families may need more than messaging to help them catch up, but I wanted to share how my health plan, health system, and provider all work together to keep my family healthy. And the statistics today we heard earlier can be daunting, but each one of those numbers that were talked about represents a child, just like mine, whose caregiver is likely just as overwhelmed as I was. And your organizations have the power to create a multi-layered approach a much needed village right now to make sure all children are protected from vaccine preventable diseases and return to in-person learning. On behalf of parents everywhere, I wanna thank you for everything you're doing and that you will take on to keep our kids safe and healthy. And I'm gonna turn things over to Jennifer Conga from the National HPV Vaccination Roundtable to share some communication resources to help support our call to action. Thanks, Sarah. You make it all very real. And so as we put out the challenge to take action between March to May for your health plans, we've told you the why, we've suggested some how, and now we'd like to present you and unveil a new suite of resources so that you can leave this call and activate your members quickly. 
what we've done is take a lot of the data from CDC, industry, and um, members amongst the more than 70 organizations that comprise the National HPV Vaccination Roundtable and put those into uh, resources you can use and run with. So there is a new webpage, hpvroundtable.org slash health plans that went live and curated these tools. Next slide. At the top of the call, you saw two brand new videos addressing some of the concerns that you heard Dr. Wharton reference. Is it safe to bring my child in? Are there any appointments available because of COVID? And also reminding me as a parent that I need to protect my child with vaccination. We have a YouTube channel um, for the roundtable where you can access these videos on a parent playlist, or you can access via our homepage with the link to YouTube. Next. We also created a suite of six new social media shareables. Um, we've actually curated these into a, a one page resource and you'll see how they correlate to different message points around access, safe return to school, protection of your children. And so there's go-to language here that you can take and run with and start using today. Next. Also, we want you to leave this call and activate your colleagues. We want you to help um, educate and inform your leadership of how important it is to take action quickly on these issues. So we have a very high level document and infographic, um, top line information from Dr. Wharton's presentation today, and then inclusive of what health plans can do to activate um, and lead this initiative. Next. And we also created two different template letters for you. So some of you already asked, like, how do we activate this information? How do we reach out to our members? We're giving you boilerplate language. So there's a letter to use here for parent outreach. And there's also a letter here that you can use with plans um, and health systems that um, convey the urgency in some of the data. Next. And for your communication channels, if you don't want to use the um, roundtable branded resources, please take and steal this messaging. Boilerplate messages around those common themes again, protection, safety, safe return to school and changing insurance status. There's also another page where you can um, take out bullets to use for your e-newsletter content and a link to the NCQA blog that was excellently written um, highlighting the, the urgency of this issue. Next. Um, two slides, this one, if your organization is looking to dive a little deeper into HPV quality improvement, we have existing resources that you can access on this page. And lastly, Anything you're looking for, next slide, um, you can go to our resource library, which is um, searchable by audience type as well as information type. So go fishing, it's all there for you to catch and get active. Mary, back to you. Terrific, thank you so much, Jennifer. And thank you to Sarah and Jennifer both for making this um, real and giving us a sense of what works on the ground. Because this is really um, how, uh, you know, how we make improvement happen. And, you know, just to, to recap a little bit from what Safine presented, you know, you need to look at data, you need to um, uh, make analysis, make decisions about where you're going to put resources, and then you need to gather your team members, whether it's the clinicians, um, and you know the 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 community uh, organizations that can help you to get this done. Um, I know that we have several questions in our um, in our Q and A, and uh, Safine Byron has uh, volunteered to answer at least one or two of them uh, in the next few minutes. Safine, thank you. Yeah, we're seeing some great questions come in. Um, clearly, we have a very engaged audience who is on the ground and doing some of these efforts. Um, so, I'll, and any of the panelists should also feel free to jump in as well. Um, so, one writer says, um, you know, what can we learn from the COVID, current COVID-19 vaccination efforts and apply to the work in promoting catch-up of missed doses? There's concern about inequities expanding, and we're all concerned about that. Um, another person writes that they're hearing from providers and health departments in certain places that they're just swamped with COVID vaccinations and some health departments have canceled immunization clinics, providers are understaffed. And then another question about 
has thought been given to holding vaccination clinics in schools. And I think those kind of all fall along those themes of the health system is overwhelmed, um, but we recognize the need and what can we do? Um, I would say, you know, holding vaccination clinics in schools, if that's a possibility in your district and area, we are looking for innovative ways and going to people where they go, right? And we've seen sort of innovative things crop up where, um, you know, stadiums and, and other venues have been converted to mass vaccination areas. But I think that in any way that we can go where people go, meet them in the community, um, that's going to help with vaccination rates. And uh, so I think that any innovative solution at this point, we've seen that with COVID-19 where people are, are really trying to think outside the box. And I think that with catch-up vaccinations, this is, it's just as important. And I, you know, I welcome any of the other panelists who may want to comment as well. All right, well, um, there was a question that, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, there was a question about, um, has the trend been no vaccines at all or series not being completed prior to the 13th birthday? And um, I, can, uh, I can say what we, we know, what we assume, but Dr. Wharton should also feel free to, to jump in with the data. Um, you know, I know that HPV vaccination in particular is difficult because it, it, it does require more than one dose. And so I would guess that there, we're seeing a little bit of both, but with the drop off in the well child visits, um, we do think that it's been no vaccinations. And I would guess that there's an additional hump to get over in terms of HPV vaccination given the multiple doses. Um, but if Dr. Wharton wants to elaborate on any of that. Yeah, thank you. We, we don't have coverage data yet, but our assumption is that this is a large number of children have missed specific doses that normally would have taken, normally would have been administered um, since mid-March of last year. Uh, maybe they didn't miss every visit, but if they got behind and they haven't been able to, to have the catch-up visits needed, um, that they've, they've fallen behind and they haven't gotten caught up yet. So my, my assumption is um, I think it's a reasonable assumption that it's a large number of children who've missed what doses were uh, should have been given during this last 12 month period. I see a question about the HPV roundtable, and so I wonder if uh, Jennifer might um, jump in about whether there are any collaboration efforts with national drugstore or grocery store chains to work on improving HPV vaccination. I was trying to type furiously, Mary. Yes, as a matter of fact, we have several um, pharmacy groups represented on the national roundtable, and the American Cancer Society as well has been in conversation with several um, chain drugstores but the reality was those conversations were a, a bit sidetracked with the pandemic. And so we have had some of those conversations, but um, we've had to step aside and given other urgencies there. I guess there's one other question that I really like. Um, is there any guidance on outreaching parents to get their COVID vaccines while their children get their required vaccines, like a co-appointment for parents and children? Well, that is just the kind of innovation that I think we're calling for because people are going to find different things that work in different places. And certainly if you have you know, a school-age child or even an adolescent who doesn't drive yet, you know, the odds are that their parent has accompanied them to their, their appointment. And so, you know, that's really a, um, it, you know, it should be workable. I can't think of any reason why it wouldn't work. So I want to applaud that questioner. Um, uh, Safine and Lindsay, do you see, are there any other questions that you think we have time to answer in the Q&A? 
Yeah, well, there's another one that I just want to highlight in the same way. Um, mobile vans going to communities. Someone typed in school-based ideas and setting up a child and adolescent immunization clinic at school football fields, soccer fields, softball fields, um, places where families show up. So I also wanted to call out that great suggestion from the audience. Um, there was a question about how best to establish baseline data and how to measure success, particularly for HPV, because monitoring for completed series is a struggle. Um, you know, the, the measure that we have in HEDIS does look at each of the rates separately for meningococcal, Tdap, and HPV, but the HPV vaccine does look for completed series. I think many health plans actually do collect the information separately so that they can break it up and um, are able then to understand, is it that, you know, they're not getting in for at all, or is it they're coming in for one dose and then not completing the series, or is it that they're completing the series, you know, maybe a little bit after the 13th birthday. So um, we know that more granular data are being collected, and I would say that would be a great place to start in terms of understanding where the missed opportunities are happening and where the gaps in care need to be closed. This is Lindsay. There was also a question asking how many state immunization registries allow plans to access registry data. And um, these requirements do vary by state. Some states, for instance, provide access to the data to health plans for little to no cost, while others charge a fee. Um, but the American Immunization Registry Association, ARA, AIRA, is a really good resource to check out and you can find out more information about how those requirements vary by state there. And um, I, I believe there's also information about this on the CDC's website as well. Great, and there's another great idea in, in the Q&A about having food trucks <laughs> and mobile vaccination clinics. Same place, same time. I think that's another great idea. Thanks for that. And thank you. Uh, one other question I saw has to do with whether there's a problem of only one well child visit being paid for a year in a calendar year. And I think that that is absolutely a place where health plans need to step up because if providers are concerned that they won't be able to administer the vaccines in catch up because they already you know, had a visit with the patient, maybe in one of those situations Dr. Wharton referred to where they hadn't ordered enough vaccine. So they were unprepared to give the vaccines when the kid came in. So now they need to see them again. And I think that health plans can absolutely be out in front in messaging to clinicians their commitment to completing vaccinations. And if catch up for vaccinations requires, you know, needs to be coded in some way to make sure it gets paid, that should happen. And there also was a, there also were some well child visits that were done via telehealth. And um, you can do a lot in a telehealth visit, but I don't know how you give a vaccine. So. Um, I sense that there's a lot of info, lot of um, questions about um, registries and immunization registries. And so I know that the information that's on our slides will be sent out to everybody after the um, tomorrow, after this webinar is over. But I think if there's any other information about the um, immunization registries that we can uh, answer either live. I think we have just a few more minutes. Um, maybe we could answer that one um, before we go on. Oh, very good. I see that um, uh, Jennifer Conga has put in the, um, the chat so that everyone can see the information about um, the what the CDC has put together and what the, the immunization registry group has put together. Um, so uh, there's a question about um, vaccination storage. And I wonder, Dr. Wharton, if you have anything to say about that um, in terms of, you know, how clinicians can be confident that they're safely storing vaccines and, and potentially for these kind of novel 
uh, places like school fields. <laughs> How could you do that? Right. So um, it, it, it is important that appropriate cold chain be maintained for vaccine inventory. And outside of the usual practice setting, there can be challenges with doing that. It's important to have the, the appropriate storage equipment and to be mon monitoring the temperature. CDC does have storage and handling resources that are available online that can help um, practices um, or, or systems that are, that are planning those kinds of outreach activities. Terrific. Well, I think um, we may be down to our final minutes here. So unless anyone has a question that they're burning to answer, I'll just give a minute for that. There is a question about, um, have you seen any providers giving rewards or incentives to parents for vaccinating their children? Offices also often provide a toy or sticker to children after their shots, but wonder if it's more effective rewarding parents who decide to vaccinate. Um, and I, you know, I would say that's another great idea that um, I know that health plans have offered rewards to their members for going to get vaccinated. And, and you know, I don't see why they couldn't team up with a healthcare provider in that respect and do something very similar. So thank you. Well, I am really uh, so delighted to have had the chance today to speak with these excellent speakers and to bring this terrific content to you all. Um, we are very glad that we will be able to um, share the slides tomorrow by email to who registered for the webinar. Um, and we are also uh, perhaps going to um, take, uh, take a look at some of these questions and see if there's any further uh, responses that we're able to offer. Um, and so, uh, really appreciate people's engagement and asking questions and, you know, listening all the way through this webinar. This has really been uh, very terrific. I want to uh, thank again Holon Solutions, who have supported this work, and um, thank uh, Dr. for joining us. Um, also, I just want to let you know that after you complete the Zoom, a survey is going to pop up in your browser, and we strongly encourage you to fill out that survey. And um, uh, it's just a few questions, but it will really help us to know, um, you know, how we can, how we can improve our communications uh, and keep getting this message out. Um, yep, and I see someone asking, will the presentation be distributed to the attendees? Yes, the, the presentation will be sent uh, tomorrow by email to everyone who registered for the webinar. So um, with that, I am, again, really thankful for uh, everyone who participated today, both our present presenters and our question askers, and uh, look forward to um, seeing uh, when it comes to the summertime that we've caught up vaccinations for all these young people and um, that they're returning to school safely. That'll really be the marker of our success. So thank you all and um, have a good afternoon.